Coming up on the program, it's all about good bugs and bad bugs in your garden, what you need to look for, and what most people or some people may consider junk, how you can benefit from it and use it as a growing device. And we'll have Mike Novak from MikeNovak.net. He's a fellow podcaster and we'll talk all about the environments in your garden. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast is permeating into your ears with your host, Joey Becker. And it could be the weeds. Some gardeners try to get all the weeds out of their garden. Other gardeners leave them in their garden. It's really a decision that you need to make. There's benefits to both sides of that. It's just something that you need to figure out what you want to do for your garden. And holly bird. Canning is a science. When you're canning, you want to make sure you follow the directions, follow the recipe, don't cut corners, don't replace things. It's crucial to you, your health, and your family. They're professional gardeners with full-time jobs. And they're on the air now. Greetings and welcome, fellow gardeners. You've tuned in to a very informative program, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast, a podcast for the health-conscious organic gardener worldwide. If you're looking to be a gardener, if you're looking to be a better gardener, or if you're looking to not experience problems in your garden and allow us to do that for you, you've tuned in to the right program. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, best friend, co-host, and gardening partner, Holly Baird, behind the TWVG microphone here in the WI Garden Media Studios in southeast Wisconsin. The information that we'll provide for you in this program is crucial to the life of your garden. You just may have to tweak some of the dates and times you applied for in your particular growing zone. If you're tuning in, you most likely know who we are. But briefly, we'll go over who we are and what we do, and then we'll discuss those good and bad bugs in your garden. We are a husband and wife couple. We have a website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, where you can find our many YouTube videos where we teach you all about gardening, what to do with the food you grow, or home canning, and many other things like reusing everyday items. And then we also have our quarterly digital magazine, which is free on our website. We put up four times a year, and that's downloadable on there as well. And then we also have this podcast. And you can find all previous podcast episodes at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com underneath the podcast tab. And there's also a question button on the website if you have a topic that you think that we should be talking about or you need an answer to, be more than happy to send us an email, and we will get back to you with the, the correct information. Well, let's talk about uh, the good bugs and the bad bugs that we will face in our garden. No matter what type of garden you do, whether it's indoors or outdoors, you are going to face some type of bug issue 99% of the time. Now, not all bug issues are bad bug issues, but we need to be aware of the type of bugs that we are seeing, the, the problems that they can cause your garden, and or the benefits that they can give your garden through the growing season. So there's the potato bug or the roly-poly. We all played with these as kids. You touch them, they roll up in a little ball, and and you roll them around. Right, and it's actually a crustacean instead of a bug, but it eats decaying vegetation, um, such as strawberries and tomatoes. Now, if you have a small population of them, that's fine. You'll Sometimes you'll turn over a rock or something, a stone in your garden, and find a couple of them. That's okay. But then if you have an overpopulation of them, that's when there's a problem. Now keep in mind, as we discuss all of these good bugs and bad bugs, uh, as we discuss the bad bugs, yes, there are chemical methods of extracting the bad bugs from your garden. But keep in mind, we don't recommend that because if you spray chemicals on your garden to get rid of those bad bugs, those chemicals are not... uh, They don't just kill the bad bugs. They kill all the bugs in your garden. And without having a balanced ecosystem, your plants and your particular growing zone can suffer. So there's a couple things you can do to keep this bug out of your garden. One is to take um, a melon like a honeydew or a cantaloupe and you leave the rind on. You cut a portion of it, put the rind so that it's facing up, and then so that the, the bugs are attracted to the inside of the the melon the melon and then what you do is you can throw them away once they start eating it cut a, cut can... a chunk out and then put the melon back in the garden yeah. and that's um, one way to to uh, try to control that population if you have an abundance of them then you can also take 
say you have some rotten vegetation in your compost pile, which is away from your garden, that will attract them and usually keep them at bay. So some old, like really old, gross kitchen scraps are good. Or um, anything like that. So you want to keep that, but make sure it's away from your garden. So let's talk about another bug that we are all uh, in desperate need of, which is the, the bee. Honeybees uh, in, has had a, a devastation of population destruction here over the last couple of years. So by the bees pollinate what we eat. Right. So, yeah, so there's many things you can do to attract bees to your garden, but one thing is is to plant a variety of flowers. Bees like the flowers because they can pollinate those flowers, and you want to go ahead and just, um, I know one thing you can find is a bee flower attraction mix. Um, I know there's one on dollarseed.com. Otherwise, you know, you can just go online and see what kind of bees, uh, what kind of flowers bees appreciate. They also like dandelions, too. So maybe if you don't pull all your dandelions or cut them all. Or some, spray poison on them yeah. and kill them out of your yard. Because when you start spraying plants with poison and bugs go to it, eat them or uh, attract or, or retain nectar or pollen from it, then that insect now has carried the poison to other parts of the colony per se, and, and it can destroy a whole ecosystem. Another thing you can do is you can buy honey from your from a local source because those beekeepers will be able to stay in business and keep their, their colonies up. So let's talk about another good bug before we talk about another bad bug. Another good bug is the ladybug. Right, the ladybug, you've seen it before. It eats aphids, and they're pretty much everywhere. I don't think you would have too many problems trying to attract them but you can buy them online yeah. and and you can uh, release them in the evening so they don't fly out of your garden if you have a really bad infestation of aphids or other insects they do eat more than just aphids but it, they're, they're one of the soldiers of the garden right and then we have earthworms now earthworms are great because they decompose their decomposer so what they're going to do is they're going to eat your soil basically they're going to break it down, and they're going to make their worm castings, which is basically worm poop, and that will add to your soil. Um, you want you do want a lot of worms in your garden because they, that's a healthy soil. For now, them. what if you do if you what if you, what do you do if you don't have the worm population that you need? Well, one thing could be you might want to look at what your environment, your garden, has been going through. If you're adding a lot of chemicals to your garden soil, you're not going to have the worm population. You can add organic material, compost, leaves, anything like that, that over time, it's not going to happen overnight. Worms will migrate into that area knowing that there is edible material for them to digest in the soil. Now, recommendations is about 10 worms per square foot is the recommended rate is what the, the scientists or people, universities say. We have counted the worms in one square foot in our particular garden, this was last year, came up with like 22. Right. So you have a lot of worms, and by not tilling the soil, you don't destroy the worms. Now, we don't till. We'll spade every now and then. We'll take the pitchfork and loosen the soil up, but we've never tilled the big garden. We've never tilled any garden. We, we've always spaded the garden, which limits the amount of worms to kill, in addition to... Uh, not stirring the soil up as uh, dramatic as a tiller would because you're basically destroying all those worm co uh, the tunnels, the uh, microbial life in the soil. You're destroying all of that, and then it has to repopulate in order to allow your plants, that, that, that for them to help your plants. So by doing that, if you do till, you can always set the tiller beside the garden, let it run for a few minutes. Vibration is in the soil is a key to danger for worms and they will realize this and they'll begin to burrow deeper and that will at least eliminate some of the, the fatalities that you will face if you do decide to till. Now you may think to yourself you're going to um, add, you know, you're, you're going to add fertilizer to your soil or compost tea or something and yeah, that's good. Fertilizer is good for your soil but the worms are really essentially better, not necessarily entirely better but you want to have a good balance of worms as well because it's going to make your Swell that much better. Let's talk about the. Uh, let's talk about another bad bug. Do we have another bad bug that we can talk about? Yeah, we have um, aphids, and we've all dealt with aphids. Aphids are 
They're, um, they're well, not... There, there's black aphids and there's white aphids and these are these little tiny bugs or specks of things on the bottom of leaves that you see roll, uh, crawling around. Right, and you can keep them at bay. We do it with our in, with our indoor plants with some um, dish soap and some water. Now, in outdoors, you're going to have ladybugs that's going to help with it. You're going to have other bugs that uh, will lay eggs in the aphids colony underneath leaves, and these bugs will know that the offspring of theirs will have a good start because they're going to feed off the aphid colony after they hatch. So it's kind of a, a balanced ecosystem. The tomato hornworm is another terrible bug that uh, it's really a worm, I assume, based on the terminology. It's a caterpillar. Caterpillar. It's another horrible bug that uh, we faced last year. The bracken and wasp can also uh, take care of the, the uh, hornworm. We've talked about that in our tomato episode. In addition, if you had uh, hornworms last year, and we found this out on a YouTube video, and I'll give credit where credit is due, Callie Kim 29 uh, she informed her viewers that if you take toilet paper tubes or paper towel tubes at the time of planting, put them around the base of your tomato plant, the hornworm cannot climb up the stalk because it gets stopped by that cone or that that barrier. So you can also use probably cut uh, two or three inches of PVC pipe if the seedlings are, are too big to fit around a paper towel tube or you can cut it. So that's one thing that we're going to work on to try to eliminate that tomato hornworm. So... With that, that's just a few, a few of the many, many dozens of good bugs and bad bugs that you're going to face in your garden. And don't f- get alarmed if you see a bug in your garden. You're going to have bugs. But take a picture of it. Just uh, write down the description of it. Go online. Figure out what you've got in your garden. You may have a, a wonderful uh, defense bug that will help control the population of, of another bug that you may not be aware of in your garden. Right, yeah, so you can definitely make sure you keep track of that, and if you have any questions, you know, you can always contact us, we can always help you out, but, you know, be specific. Yeah, and also take pictures, if, if you want to, another good resource is your local university, they will they have a bug guy there, yeah. or a bug woman, and that's all really what they do, is they deal with infant stations, because you may have a problem in Rale- Raleigh, North Carolina, that no other part of the country has, by by contacting your local university there and showing them a picture through email, they can identify, hey, this is X bug, and here's what you need to do to control it. And you could also be helping them because, say, there's an invasive species, and all of a sudden you end up with this invasive species in your backyard, and maybe it's not common there. That can help them as well. Absolutely. So just some of the big bu- the bad bugs and the good bugs that you're going to face in your garden, we all have them. We'll all have issues with them, but we need to know what we're looking at and whether or not we should try to eliminate them or let them be and let nature take care of them. We'll be right back after this, talking about using items that most people would just throw away. <laughs> A gardener knows that the key to a good plant is its roots. With poor roots, the end result is not good. Conventional pots and trays cause roots to wrap around and become root-bound. Then you try to unwrap the roots at the time of planting, hoping not to break them. But never again with the root maker, a non-chemical innovation that naturally air prunes roots to create more vigorous roots. Never a root-bound plant again. Whether trees, flowers, or edibles, home garden or commercial grower, more roots means healthier, more productive plants. To get your own, visit rootmaker.com. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala Kombucha makes your body smile. If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear, penetrating product called Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your bare, untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops, by spraying Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts. Internal Wood Stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatings.com. 
Hey there, this is Hugh Richards from the YouTube channel Hughes Nursery, which teaches you how you can grow organic vegetables cheaply and easily at home. You're currently listening to Joey and Holly Baird on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. Welcome back to the program. If you want to know more about the sponsors you've just heard in our entire sponsor lineup, you can check them out at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Click on the podcast tab at the top of the page. Check them out. See if they have something that can help you be a better gardener. Support them because they support us in the same gardening beliefs. Those links are also in the show notes below. We've got a new segment this week. Uh, we'll have a new segment on each show. and This segment is called Tell Me What You Really Think. Where we, Holly and myself, we're going to just uh, kind of go off the record, vent a little bit, and tell you what we really think. A lot of times we uh, try to keep a very professional manner when talking about negative and positive stories or topics in our gardening uh, media outlets, whether digital magazine or weekly videos, as well as this particular broadcast. But we're going to take about three or four minutes and just kind of go off the record and tell you what you what we really think about a topic that we decide to talk about each show. So we're going to talk about the people that, this week, that they're kind of the gardeners that they go out, they buy everything new every year. And they, they just, okay, well, I'll just throw money at it type of gardener. And to us, that's kind of frustrating. First of all, you know, they're putting their stuff in the landfills. Say their tomato cages and maybe their seed trays or whatever and they could be recycling them or giving them to maybe a community garden and they just you know they just kind of half-ass it they don't i we appreciate the people are trying to grow food but these people are they trying to grow food but then they're also uh putting the environment at the expense so you you, you see these people and, and and holly and i have experienced this uh you know all the tomato cages that you see we use on our video series on the on the website and the YouTube channel we didn't buy a single tomato cage i spent one summer well late fall and early winter of one year picked all of them up i think we ended up with almost 100 tomato cages of all sizes variations of sizes and 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 uh, types of tomato cages that people at the end of the season ripped them out and threw them on the curb and some of these tomato cages actually had the tomatoes still in the cage that they just ripped out of the garden and threw on the on the front lawn for the junk man to pick up. Right. So they, that's it's terrible. Or you go you know, you go to the garden center and you see the people that buy the tomatoes that are in, in the pots with the tomato cage. M- money's it, not an issue to them. Right. They want the I've got it now and it's ready to go mindset. They don't want to work for anything and they want things to be ready to go when they want it. And that's I guess all good and well, but at the same time I feel that these people are are the reason maybe wh- why we're having, you know, 3 feet of snow on the ground in March in the, on the East Coast and and a drought in California because they just don't care. They don't care. And that frustrates uh, myself and Joey because you have to care, especially if you have children or grandchildren or if you, even if you don't and you still have to leave something for the future inhabitants of the world and you're just like, well, whatever, I'm just going to throw this out. Too bad, so sad. Next year I'll start over. And just like we talked about in the first segment, these are the same group of individuals Hey, I've got a bug problem or I got a weed problem. I'm just going to spray poison on everything and that'll fix the problem. Right. That's another thing is they okay, I'll just slap some miracle girl on it or round up my dandelions. So that's just a little bit of uh tell me what you really think. Is that all you got? I think so. All right, that's all we got. So, now that we've got that out of our system for the right, show. I got one more. You got one more? Yeah, I work at a garden center, and I work there. I work there seasonally. This is hopefully my last season working there. But sometimes I have to water the plants, you know, because that's what plants need is water. What really? <laughs> and I gotta put the hose, you know. And sometimes it gets in the way, I guess, and people get pissed because they gotta take their cart and put it over the hose. And it's like, and then they then they get mad at me, and then they say they walk past and they see me water. That's an easy job. And it's like, no, when you spend four hours watering and you got to reach up high, I'm not saying it's the hardest job I've ever done, but at the same time, it's like, just shut up and with your cart, get over yourself. Is that it? Yeah. All right. (laughs) All right, so let's talk about some items that maybe those individuals that we just talked about 
would be providing for us on junk day that we can use to benefit yeah. in our gardens and your gardens. Don't be hesitant to drive around early in the morning on junk day. You'll be amazed of some of the garden-related items that you can use in your garden, as well as some of the items that you could use in your house that people throw away because they just want it to disappear. So a couple of things, just like we talked about, was the tomato cages. The tomato cages, there's people throw them away all the time. And we found, like I said, over a hundred of them. That and as we've used them, I mean, they're not the they're not the sturdiest ones. They're not the forty five dollar Texas tomato cages. But these are ones that will work for what we need them for. Right, and that's just it. Is that you know I understand that stuff falls apart, but at the same time we've had some perfectly nice ones just come you know come to us and sometimes we've had to take two of them put them together to equal the strength of a a, a new one but still it works another thing that people throw out that you can use that we find and you can use this even if you're not a gardener fence posts people will throw fence fence posts out all the time they'll throw uh if you can and you see this if you drive around on junk day i know some of you do we've done it you can see when somebody has passed away in the house they've put everything that that previous owner had on the curb, whether it's couches, shovels, dressers, uh, garden material, garden, whatever the, whatever the case is, or somebody has been evicted, everything's on the corner. It's kind of, you know, a free yard sale type of thing. Right. So, yeah. And so then there's stuff even like, uh, hanging flower baskets. You'll see people, maybe they get them for Mother's Day and then come July, they forgot to water them. A week later, they forget to water them. (laughs) And we have a geranium in our kitchen that comes flowers every year that we found and on the side of the road. We didn't have to do anything. That's about it. five years old. That geranium. Yeah. It, it was almost dead. It was in a giant pot, and and I repotted it, and we've had to cut it back several times because of the size of it. But it's worked for. It's, it's really nice plant. Pink and red. And and these hanging pots, you can grow herbs in them. We do it all year round in the kitchen. We put herbs in the hanging pots. Now, if you buy these hanging pots from your garden center or online, you're looking at eight to twelve dollars a hanging basket or hanging mm-hmm. plastic green pot or black pot you can find them for free you just dump the soil out not on the curve where you find it just you know bring it home you want to grab the stuff and you don't want to linger around you want to drive around once see what you see and then decide what you want to make a move on but that's another thing that you can find uh, box fan grates we've all had box fans the plastic grates on the outside uh, on both sides you can cut them directly down the center and you have four protective uh, fences for a small plant. That works really good, and then you can recycle the box fan, uh, be- unless it works. A lot of times they work, too, but that's beside the point. But if they don't work, then fo- box fan grates work really good for young seedlings just to keep animals from eating them. Right. So there's that. Then oh, there's... baby cribs. You can use everything on a baby crib. <laughs> Yeah, you can. You can use the rails. You can use that springy thing. The the, the mattress frame. The, yeah, the mattress frame thing. And, and the nice thing about that, these people are wanting it to disappear on junk day. So they have disassembled it for your convenience. <laughs> so you can throw it in your car, your truck, your van. It's all in pieces. All you got to do is pick it up and put it in there. They've already taken it apart for you. And don't think for a second that Joey and I are driving some sort of SUV or truck. We drive Honda Civics. So, a lot of times, you know, we get this stuff to fit if we have to. Joey's got a two-door, i got a four-door, so sometimes you got to put the seat down. But it's not like we're driving around with a trailer and a truck. You know, we just ha- have our our, um, our little Civics. Yeah, you know, we, we take the small stuff and the people with the trailer and trucks come in behind us and pick up the rest. So right. And then we see them. Yes. So, the, that, the baby crib for the side, you can make uh, teepee trellises. You can do uh, arch trellises. It works really well uh, for the wooden side planks. And then the bottom actually works really well, too, for uh, uh, climbing vegetables. The same thing with the dog cage or dog kennel, whatever you want to call it. You do want to clean them. You take a, yeah. bleachy, subs- a bleachy, bleachy soap and just clean that off just to make sure there's no uh, bad stuff on it before you put it in your garden. Uh, PVC pipe works really good if you're constructing trellises. A lot of people throw that out. Now you want to be careful about that uh, in case it, you might want to see if it's been used or you can see the remnants of the internal material, whether it's maybe a sewer pipe or something. You've you got to be uh, a disclaimer on that one. But that uh, we found several of them that were used as Christmas decorations because they had North Pole, South Pole uh, wooden uh, signs on them, and they had Christmas lights on them, and they work very well for some pole trellises that we have constructed in our garden that we use on occasion. 
So that's just some of the stuff. And, and I know that you guys, you, you listeners, are very creative and you probably have some unique items that you found on junk day or you've seen somebody else throw out that you have used in your garden. And if you do, send us an email with a picture of it. We'd like to put it on our Facebook page. And our Facebook page is... Wisconsin Vegetable Gardeners. And we have uh, had some emails come in from our previous episode with homemade trellises, and we appreciate that very much. So just share the information to where we all can be more creative in uh, how we grow. We will be right back after this time out with the exciting Mike Novak from the Mike Novak Internet Experience. Right after this. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautiful. Beautifully with the Embrace. Available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. Paradigm Garden, Wisconsin's largest progressive gardening center. Located in Madison, Wisconsin, Paradigm Gardens offers the largest selections of soil amendments, organic and salt-based plant nutrients, grow lights, and hydroponic systems available in the Midwest. Our knowledgeable and experienced sales staff are always available to help. Visit our new website, www.paradigmgardens.com, or visit our retail store at 4501 Helgeson Drive, Madison, Wisconsin, just off Stoughton Road. Hi, this is Chris Van Cleve, host of the Rose Chat Podcast. You can hear us at rosechatpodcast.com. But right now, we're going to talk vegetables, and you're listening to Joy and Holly Baird on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the program. Interested, we encourage you to check out the sponsors you've just heard, and our entire sponsor lineup can be found on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com. Support them because they support us in the same gardening beliefs that you should be able to grow anywhere for free. Our next guest, formerly a host on WCPT Chicago, the Mike Novak Show, has moved to a new network, which is the GGGD Radio Network. This can be heard weekdays from 1 to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Mike often says his background in gardening is show business, which is pretty close to the truth. Although he is an Illinois master gardener and open lands tree keeper, he's actually a professional writer, actor, director, radio personality, and a fervent amateur when it comes to growing things. Mike is an award-winning columnist for Chicagoland Gardening Magazine. He is also an author of the book Attack of the Killer Asparagus and Other Lessons Not Learned in the Garden. We're going to talk about all that and more. Welcome, Mike. Hey, that's all the time we have. Good night, everybody. <laughs> uh, we also want to make mention your website, Mike Novak.net. Uh, the, the, all that information will be in the show notes. Mike, you've been around gardening for a lot of your life. How did you get involved in gardening? Was it something you picked up as a child or you found later on in life? No, I really didn't uh, pick it up as a child. In fact, I was a terror in my mother's garden. Uh, yeah. My brother and I uh, would go, uh, and she, you know, like many gardeners um, of her generation had rows and rows of hostas, um, uh, like soldiers, you know, along the fence. And my brother and I would go through the garden, and just before the flowers opened up on the hostas, we would squeeze them because they made a popping noise. Um, (laughs) And it never occurred to me (laughs) that we were probably destroying the flowers and destroying the bloom. But, you know, most people don't grow hostas for the bloom anyway. Uh, they do it because they need a space to fill in. Uh, although, the, you know, but that's changed in, in the last couple of decades where hostas have become, um, as I once told the group, there are now officially more hosta varieties than there are actual hosta plants on the planet. Um, and it's just just so many, and you can't keep track of them. Uh, but they are some of them are just wonderful, and even the blooms are fragrant, and um, the the leaf structure is remarkable. And and uh, if you've got shade, I really understand why people might grow them. But yeah. but but getting back to um, uh, uh, so the, it didn't come from my parents. Although the one thing that my mom did pass along to me is a love for bee balm um, or monarda. 
um, and she grew that in her garden. She called them firecrackers, uh, and her mother grew them in her garden. Uh, and I have plants in my yard, and it, it's it's kind of hard to keep track, but it's possible they go back 70 years to my grandmother's garden. Um, and and so there is a little bit of a, a tradition there. And and I, and I love the fact that Monarda is a native, um, and I never knew that until I started studying horticulture. Um, but here it is, passed along from generation to generation in my family. But my, my interest really took off uh, in the 90s, um, and, uh, and that was because, weirdly enough, I had a vacation home in the Pacific Northwest in the rainforest, a temperate rainforest where um, they get uh, you know, anywhere from 150 to 175 inches of rain a year. Um, and there are 200-foot-tall conifers and lichens and moss and ferns, and it's green uh, 12 months of the year. Uh, and I began getting interested in plants there because I thought, wow, this is, this is great stuff. You go on walks and you would look at stuff, and I wanted to know what it was. And I realized I don't know anything about plants in the Midwest, really. I, you know, I'm learning all of this stuff about plants in the Northwest where I've got this, this home, and I didn't know anything here, so I came back to Chicago, uh, became a master gardener, uh, and because I was working at WGN radio at the time, I ended up doing a radio show. I was sitting in with somebody else who was doing the show, Kathy O'Malley, uh, and then she left and she said, it's yours if you want it. I went, uh, okay. Now 17 years later, here I am still uh, talking about gardening. Uh, and you know, I don't know. I know how you guys do it. I've seen your videos and stuff. You like to teach people stuff. I'm, I'm, and I realize that I'm not the guy who sits there and waits for the phones to ring uh, and answers questions for people. I like to bring in smart people to my program uh, and ask questions. I have, I always have questions to ask, and I think it's because, as you mentioned, Holly, at the beginning of this piece. Um, I really am kind of a, an average gardener. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a novice, and I'm, I feel like I learn something every day about gardening, and I love learning more, and I, and I want my listeners to experience that joy of discovery. So that's why I bring on smart people who have been doing this a long time, who know stuff, uh, and I ask them questions and hope I get good answers. Fantastic. Now, speaking of that, you're a big advocate of composting for obvious reasons. What are some not so obvious reasons that the average weekend gardener may not fully understand about composting and why it's important? I think what the average gardener does not understand about composting is that the name of the game is biology. Um, I sometimes tell folks it's the bi it's the biology, stupid, uh, and I don't mean to be mean. I'm just you know borrowing that phrase, but it is. It's the biology. It's one of the things that I have learned uh, over the last couple of decades, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with the soil food web, um, and that concept is what carries me. I mean, I love uh, Jeff Lohenfeld's book, Teeming with uh, Microbes, um, uh, A Gardener's Guide to the Soil Food Web, and it's come out in another edition now. Um, but as he points out in his book, when you create compost, what makes compost work, what makes it heat up is the biology in there. And when you put that in your garden and your lawn, and not enough people put compost on their lawns, and they really should, um, because if you're going to have a lawn, and you know, my, 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 <laughs> my uh, philosophy about lawns is when in doubt, rip it out. Uh, and then put in a vegetable garden. Um, but that has evolved over the years, too. But getting back to that, you can put compost, sifted compost on your lawn. You can put compost in your garden. And what you're doing is adding biology. Yeah, you're also adding tilth and, to some degree, nutrients. But really, and this is why people uh, brew compost tea, it's for the biology. So you want that biology in your soil. That's what makes plants happy. That's what makes plants healthy. Uh, and I think that is what most people don't understand about using compost. Now, one of the uh, one of the things that gardeners typically don't think about when planting in a new area or starting a new vegetable bed or they've moved to a new house is the possibility of contaminants in the soil, whether that be lead or some kind of chemicals. 
Is there really any telltale signs from above the ground that you can see that something's not right? Or is it really all the information you get from a soil test that you would send off to your local university? Well, it's, it, it, do you know the history of the site? That's where you start. And if you're in the city, you know that the, there are cars that have been by for, uh, for decades. And, and until the late 70s, they had lead in the gasoline. Uh, you know that lead paint was available until about the same time. You know, late 70s, early 80s, things got phased out. But lead persists. Uh, some of that lead is still there. I did a soil test in my backyard uh, right outside my house, which is a 125-year-old home. So there's been a lot of lead paint put on this house over the years. Um, and I did a soil test right outside the house, and, it, and, the, and the lead levels were through the roof. It was insane. Um, and yet this whole thing is controversial. I was talking to a, a good friend of mine um, who you should have on your show, by the way. Uh, her name is Lamanda Joy. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but her new book this year is Start a Community Food Garden, The Essential Handbook. Um, and she is part of what's called the Peterson Garden Project here in Chicago. And I interviewed her, and we got into this a little bit, and she kind of pointed out that I might be a little uh, dramatic about it. <clears throat> and... Um, I, I see why she's right, because the deal is when you're growing food in what might be contaminated soil, don't eat the soil. Now, that sounds silly, but the point is wash it. Wash it if you're really concerned about it and you've done a soil test, or if you don't know, if you haven't done a soil test, but because uh, as, you, as you asked me, can you tell from the surface? Well, no, unless you see a bunch of paint chips there like you did do outside my house and go, oh, I'll bet those are contaminated with lead. You really do have to do a soil test to find out. But you can, you can, you can make a guess, or you can just decide not to deal with it altogether and just create a raised bed. Then, boom, you're, you don't even have to worry about a soil test. You've created a raised bed. You bring in your own soil. Uh, you do it that way. Um, but the point is when you grow vegetables in there, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One, that the fruiting bodies of vegetables do not accumulate those toxins like lead. So a tomato is not likely to have it. You, know, you need to worry more about root vegetables and leafy vegetables. And the reason you need to worry about those vegetables is really not so much that they're absorbing it because the studies are still inconclusive about that, but because as you harvest them, you might have some of that soil on them. So what's the answer? Wash them. Just be really careful about washing those vegetables. Now, people use a lot of different terms when it comes to gardening and landscaping. We're going to talk about two different terms here that are used. Explain to our listeners what those terms mean. One is hard soil. Okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I know hard tan. You know, um, I, it, this is a uh, you know, this is a, a concept that um, I, I really haven't run across. How do you describe hard soil? You, see, now you're going to get to educate me a little bit here. <laughs> to me, it's um, something that is soil that has been compacted. Compaction or very densely uh, like clay soil and lacks nutrients. And oh, okay. Well, yeah. Okay, we're talking about the same thing then. Yeah, you know, hard soil, hard tan compacted soil where, where you've taken, you know, that's why we warn people in the spring, uh, and especially here in the, the northern climes where there's been ice and snow and people have not been able to get out into their gardens and they're just itching to get out there. And then what do they do? They trample all over it and they compact the soil and it's really hard to uncompact it. Uh, so yeah, if you're talking about compaction, oh yeah, I, you know, uh, I tell folks, you, you be careful, you know, add compost each year. Um, that's another thing. You get that uh, good tilt, but do be careful that you're not compacting soil. When, you're, uh, when you do tree care work, the guys, they, they love to do it in the winter uh, because one of the things they don't do is compact the soil with equipment. Um, that's a good thing when the ground is frozen. You can bring in uh, the, uh, the, the, the heavy equipment that they use in tree care uh, and not do damage. Also, you don't have things growing around the base of a tree at that point, um, and and that's why that works. So, yeah, uh, it's a real good thing not to compact your soil, but if you're stuck with clay soil, obviously, 
um, this is a, a time, and, I, and I'm not a huge fan of rototilling. I think some people do it religiously twice a year uh, and don't know why they're doing it. If you got a hard pan, I think you do it once and you add your amendments, or you did it, do it a couple of times and add your amendments, and then once you've gotten that loosed up, loosened up, just add your compost on top of it. I mean, it's the way Mother Nature kind of does it, and uh, uh, I think you'll be fine. Absolutely, and that's the way uh, we, we encourage a, a non-tilling type of garden. We'll, we'll spade it, but we won't till it to kill a lot of the worms. The other terminology, and I think a lot of people are excited about when they hear this, low-impact gardening. What does that term mean? Wow, this is this. You're putting me through the the the, uh, the ringer here. Just low impact gardening. I don't know. I mean, again, um, you, it's possible you've talked about this term with other people, uh, and that it's it's one of those uh, things flying out there. Um, what I would say low impact gardening is to me is gardening in a way that doesn't disturb uh, nature. The, uh, as much as you know, I, I, I tell you, one we just talked about it. Uh, n- no more of that uh, tilling over and over again. That's high impact stuff. You're you're taking. Uh, I talked about the soil food web. You're busting up the soil food web and all the critters that are in there when you rototill. Um, so low impact would be let's be gentler. Let's let's put in native plants. Let's let them do their thing and get their roots down deep. Let's uh, let's add compost, um, even mulching. My friend uh, Roy Diblick. Have you talked to Roy from Northwind Perennial Farm? No, we have not. Okay, he's in Wisconsin. It's in Burlington, um, and he's not he's not big on veggies, but um, he 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 is big on telling people that aside from around trees, where you talk about mulch, you know, mulching trees is a great thing. Um, but in other kinds of garden, mulch can actually be really harmful. It, it can it can destroy the soil, and you and you see it all the time. You guys, somebody's got a um, a couple of daylilies and a, a Russian sage and lots of open space, and those plants look terrible, and it's all mulched within an inch of its life. Um, and his whole idea is get plant communities close together and let them supply their own mulch and and uh, uh, let them work with each other and hold each other up. And I, I kind of agree with that. So uh, getting back to low impact is like do it in a way that isn't messing with mother nature, isn't wreaking havoc on your own environment. That's what I would say. Now let's talk about a lot of a lot of gardeners. They plant fruit trees, regular pretty trees. Let's talk about the proper way to plant a tree. We see landscapers and we see city workers. They put a tree in the ground. They mulch about four foot of mulch around the base of the trunk. And then they strap it down like it's a radio tower, hoping it never blows away. This is not, this is not good for a tree, is it, Mike? The whole idea of, of, of tying up a tree when it's young. I had a, a woman talk to me just a couple of weeks ago. I was doing a, a talk at a garden club, and she was asking me about a tree, uh, and she said, should I stake it? And I said, hey, you know, how big is the thing? And it turns out it was like it from a gallon pot, and it was a little whip. And I said, that tree's not going to blow over. There's, <laughs> there's not enough to it to be blown over by the wind. And, and there are studies that show that uh, trees that are left to their own devices and have, a little, have to put up a little resistance to the wind are actually going to be stronger in the long run. Um, and it's really important that you plant a tree at grade level also. Uh, one of the things I discovered the hard way is that when you buy a, like a bald and burlap tree, and, and, and folks who have ever done that know that you know you get this, this burlap and wire and it's around the root ball of a tree, which has been dug up, by the way, and, and a lot of the roots have been destroyed in, in just digging up this tree so they can sell it. Uh, so the tree is already under stress. Um, and then what happens is you discover that the, the soil line is buried in the root ball so that, you know, there's a, uh, a tree should have a little flare right at the soil line. They call it a little root flare there. And that's right where it should be at the grade, grade level. Well, sometimes those root flares are buried in the bald and burlap. So if you plant it, where the top of the ball and burlap is, you're planting it too deep, and that's death for a tree. So be careful to make sure that you plant your tree at grade so that 
uh, and, and check, check, do a little digging around the top of that bald and burlap uh, so that it, uh, it is not below grade because you can kill a tree a lot faster burying it too deep than you can burying it too high. Well, great. And we want to we thank you. That's tons of great information. Now, where can people find you and find your, um, your new show and, or your newer show and also uh, where they can get your book? What, what's the best location for them to go? Well, um, first of all, go to MikeNovak.net, and it's M-I-K-E-N-O-W-A-K.net. And I pronounce it Novak because I'm Polish, and that's the way Mom and Dad did. So, you know, I'm kind of stuck with it, and everybody spells it wrong, so I spell it out for you. But I'm also uh, working with the Green Divas, um, and they're a, a network uh, online, and they've got a lot of great programming. Uh, and you can go to gdgdradio.com. Uh, I, you know, as we're talking now, as we're doing this interview, um, my show is on 1 to 3 p.m. Central Time every day. Uh, it's possible by the time this show airs, it will have changed. So go to the gdgdradio.com and, and track down Mike Novak um, and, uh, and see if it's there. My book, uh, Attack of the Killer Asparagus and Other Lessons Not Learned in the Garden, can be uh, uh, you can get a copy of that at aroundtheblockpress.com, aroundtheblockpress.com, and it's right there. And um, it's based on my kind of dystopian columns for Chicagoland Gardening Magazine. I, 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 you know, the response to the book has been really great because people say to me, "Wow, after reading this book, I don't feel so stupid anymore in my garden. Everybody has problems," and I'm saying, "Yep." It's true. Anybody who's ever grown plants has killed plants. That's the way it goes. And, and that book is not just for people in the Chicagoland area. That's a universal, international, informational type of book. Well, I, informational might be uh, leading people astray. It's a humor book, basically. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> um, you know, people will learn things accidentally uh, by reading the book. I've had people say, yeah, I learned all kinds of things in uh, reading your column. And I always think, wow, I didn't mean to put any information in there, but I'm glad you did. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a, anybody uh, anywhere can uh, grab a copy of the book um, and, I think, get something out of it. Thank uh, Mike, a lot of great information. Thank you for coming on the program. And all of those links that Mike has mentioned will be in the show notes so you can easily assess them and go over and check out his information. We'll be back right after this. <music> Looking for a fast-acting, non-toxic weed killer for your organic garden? One that works in cool and cloudy conditions as low as 40 degrees and is highly biodegradable with visible results in less than two hours? Then look no more. Avenger Weed Killer has it all and more. Made from oranges, Avenger is highly effective, easy to use, and has a pleasant citrus aroma. It is armory listed and approved for organic gardeners under the USDA's National Organic Program. Avenger Weed Killer is a choice for organic gardeners and homeowners who are looking for an effective, safe way to control unwanted weeds. Available in ready-to-use sprays and concentrate. Ask your local lawn and garden supplier for Avenger Weed Killer. For more information and a list of suppliers, visit AvengerOrganics.com. Avenger Weed Killer. Eco-friendly, deadly to weeds. It's all about the soil at ManureTea.com. With their grass-fed, antibiotic, and growth hormone-free cattle and horses, owner Annie Haven puts the quality in her premium soil conditioner. 100% organic and natural, whether feeding your flowers or veggies, indoors or out, you can grow organically with confidence. To purchase authentic Haven brand manure tea, small orders or large, go to manuretea.com. Always free shipping! Hi, I'm Douglas E. Welch from A Gardener's Notebook at douglasewelch.com. Whether I'm out working in the garden or dreaming of gardening during the long, cold winter nights, I love to hear what's happening in the garden with Joey and Holly Baird on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. It's always exciting to have Mike uh, on the program when he comes on. He's uh, very vocal about his uh, thoughts about things, and he's pretty right a lot of the time, if not all the time. He's a pretty lively guy. Welcome back to the program, everybody. If you want to know more about the pie, the sponsors you've just heard and our entire sponsor lineup, you can check them out via our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. It's a place for all things organic and worldwide organic health-conscious gardeners. You can click on the podcast tab at the top of the page. Support them, our sponsors, because they support us in the same gardening beliefs. Those links are also in the show notes below. Well, we've got two more topics before we get out of here this week. 
One is gardening in two minutes, and we're going to talk about free resources in your area to help build your soil. Gardening in Two Minutes is an audio production that Holly and I produce on a weekly basis for a number of radio programs and a, a number of podcasts and a few radio programs. If you would like Gardening in Two Minutes on your particular program, you can contact us through the website. This Gardening in Two Minutes is all about reading your plants to tell you what is wrong with your soil. This Gardening in Two Minutes is sponsored by Winchester Garden Fertilizer, family owned and operated out of Winchester, Ohio, with their line of 100% select organic fertilizer for the home health conscious gardener. Find their product at wgardens.com. And here is Gardening in Two Minutes. This is Gardening in Two Minutes. Though it is the middle of summer, it is a great opportunity to go to your garden, whether you have a traditional ground garden, containers, or raised beds, and look at your plants. Your plants will tell you a lot about what's going on beneath the surface in your soil. Your soil could be lacking some nutrients, and this includes things like major nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. When you're looking at a bag of fertilizer, this is the NPK. And there's secondary nutrients and there's trace minerals. When it comes to the main nutrients, things such as nitrogen, if you're lacking that, you'll see light green leaves and stunted growth. If you're lacking, if you're not seeing a good plants are lacking phosphorus, this includes things like smaller yields of seeds and fruits, and then purplish leaves, stems, and branches. And again, when you're lacking potassium, this includes reduced yields, spotted or curled leaves, and a weak root system. Now, we found this information at dollarseed.com, and there's a tab that says Garden Soil Nutrition. This is a great resource that you can go and find what your plants are acting like, as well as the solution to the problem that your soil may be lacking for the main nutrients, the MPKs, as well as the secondary nutrients. And then the trace minerals are those that you, you hear about in the glacial rock dust that you can purchase for an extended price at your local, at some local garden centers. And sometimes it's a specialty item you have to order online. But you want to look at your main nutrients and your secondary nutrients. By having those, you're going to have very healthy plants in your garden. For more information about soil nutrients, our weekly video productions, as well as our digital quarterly downloadable free magazine, you can find all that information at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. For Gardening in Two Minutes, I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. Let's talk about leading off of that Gardening in Two Minutes. Let's talk about some of the ways that we can build our soil really pretty much for free for the most part. Right, so there's many different resources you have available to you that you may not know about in your community. And one of them, which is a really phenomenal resource, is coffee grounds. Now you may think, okay, I drink coffee every day, I can collect my own grounds. But sometimes if you have a big place to grow, you might need more. Or maybe you don't want to collect your grounds, you just want to have somebody else do it for you. So what we do is we... We, uh, we go to our local coffee shop. We just call them ahead of time. They said, bring in a five-gallon bucket. You know, you can put your name on it. I never do because I know which one is ours. And there's other people that bring theirs in because when I go pick it up, there's other ones sitting there. And um, and you just uh, go ahead and you, they, they fill it up for you. And they thank me. When I go drop that bucket off, they say thank you because otherwise I think they know that it's just going to go into the landfill or whatever. Now, they'll fill a five-gallon bucket up in less than a day's time. If it's, I mean, if it's, if you live, we live in, you know, the Milwaukee area, so there's people that go in there and get coffee, but most coffee shops, yeah, I'd say they would fill it up in less than a day's time. Now, there are large, this is a local chain, there are large chains that do provide, upon requesting, uh, they will provide coffee grounds, but I kind of go with the local ones because they understand and others understand that if you don't pick those coffee grounds up, that they're just going to go to the landfill. Now, we started, you know, we, we would get, uh, what about four, 20 gallons of coffee grounds a week yeah. there for a while. And we got to the point where we had bags upon bags upon bags built up at the garden where we didn't have nowhere to go with it. Right. And we just kind of had to stop getting coffee grounds because we had maxed out where we were going to put them in. We add them to our, our, our uh, co uh, compost piles as well. And we add them to the, the place where we planted corn. 
and in and where we planted potatoes and et cetera and all the places that we could help enrich the soil. But there's a certain point where we have to say, hey, we, we've used everything that we can use. We don't need any more. Right. And like I said, there's there's other people that want them or need them and there's other buckets sitting there. So, you know, the more the merrier. Now, you and I kind of made this observation and I can be completely wrong on it. If you're in an area where you don't have access to coffee grounds, there's a pretty good chance you have access to manure. Yeah. Rabbit manure, chicken manure, turkey, cow, whatever the case is. It seems like that's the balance. If you don't have coffee grounds, you have manure. If you don't have manure, you have access to coffee grounds. Now, I may be totally wrong on that observation. No, I think it's pretty true. But, but that, that's kind of where I'm looking at on that. Uh, you can use... Uh, leaves. Leaves is one of the best things that we have found in our garden. Now, obviously, leaves in the mid-portions of the summer don't exist on the ground, but come fall, people are throwing their leaves away. This <laughs> is a major resource for you as a gardener. If you've watched some of our videos in late fall, we, have, we leaf vacuum and pile on our raised berm garden on beds that are particularly poor in soil, nutrients based on, as we learned about in gardening in two minutes, the way the plants look and respond to their growth during the summer, we will pile leaves on three or four foot tall in these beds, and then by spring, it is down to about a foot. Yeah. And we have used all the leaves on the property. We've raked leaves off the neighbor's property. We've actually went in the street with the, the leaf vacuum and sucked up leaves uh, that people have thrown in the street that's next to the, the big garden, and I think we still don't have enough leaves. But this is a great resource, and then you can stockpile these leaves. Uh, you can get them off the, the growing beds in the spring, like we have, and then you can use them as mulch around plants during the growing season, and they'll break down throughout the growing season. Grass clippings are another great use of reuse, renewable resources that you have available. You just want to dry them out on your uh, driveway on a tarp so you're not putting wet grass clippings around plants as mulch, but that's another another thing. What other uh, free resources uh, can be found that you may not have uh, a knowledge about? Brewer, brewery grains. Brewery grains, spent yeah. brewery grains. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a, a, a local brewery, this, now we're not really talking about the big nationwide chains. I mean, we're talking about the little little brewery a little um, craft brewery. This might be easier for us because we're in Milwaukee area, but, you know, it's a lot of times craft breweries, small breweries are becoming more and more popular. So um, if you do have that option, then you can get those back brewery grades. Now, you kind of want to do your research because different resources uh, indicate that some brewery grains may cause the seeds to not germinate mm -hmm. if you plant them. Uh, and you've incorporated that then brewery grain. So that's something you want to be just a, a cautionary warning about. Also, wood chips uh, you can use as mulch, as the Back to Eden method, as well as just using as a, uh, a weed barrier for walk paths and aesthetic looks yeah. around your garden. Another wonderful resource that you may have. And if you can find wood chips and a wood chip pile, and, and Wayne Metter from uh, A World for Change TV, he's coming up on a, a, an episode here in, in the next couple of months. He found 20-year-old wood chip pile, and that the bottom was completely biodegraded, rotted uh, black soil mm -hmm. from these uh, wood chips, and it makes a great uh, addition to your organic material that you will add to your vegetable garden. Right. So those are some great free resources, and maybe you have, um, you know, a neighbor that I don't know. You can ask for any of these resources. Um, or maybe they brew their own beer. A lot of people will brew their own beer in their kitchen or basement or whatever. You could do that too. Um, I don't know if there's any benefit to any sort of wine type thing, but if some people make their own wine, so maybe there's some waste from that. I don't know. So that's just some of the things that you may want to do a little research on in your particular area to uh, get uh, some more free resources for your garden. We appreciate you joining us this week. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you want to know more or have any questions, uh, you can find the information on the website as well as the contact button, and we will get an answer back to you if you have a particular question about a particular problem. The audio that you have heard through the program is courtesy of freesfx.co.uk and audioneutronics.com. Those are two free, royalty-free, copyright-free audio 
websites that we use to help jize up the podcast. Ness Alec Kombucha and Paradigm Gardens provided their own music for their ad. Until next time, I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. And we will see you in the garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast is a production of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for the health conscious organic gardener worldwide and distributed in association with WI Garden Media.